Let's go one more time. Thank you. Pray. second time that the nerves would go away, that's a lie. That's a lie. I think it's worse this time than it was last time. I don't make no sense. You think I'd be comfortable? It's coming though. But the last time I was here, we talked about being new creatures. All right. About letting the old you pass away and becoming part of God's kingdom. Yes, sir. We became part of God's petting zoo. All his new creatures are in there roaming around in the lands in authority like we were created to do. All right. And when we do a good job and obey our master's commands, he walks by us, pats us on the head, and says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Every time we get commended, we get excited, we get happy, and we want to run around and gloat on ourselves. Not in a private way, but you just want everybody to know how good you've been and how you've been holding fast to your status. Amen. We're just like kids who, when they do something good and they run around, they tell mommy and daddy what they did because they want you to be proud of them. They come home and they scream, mommy, mommy, and you're like, what? You're like, well, you know, there was this, there was this, I don't know why they always do this. They, they hands and they do this and they, and they hold this. There was this boy at school and like, guess what he did? What? He sneezed. You know? They freak out. They're like, boy, you know, you. guess what I did? They're like, what? I said, bless you. <laughs> but they, they just want to hear you say, I'm proud of you. It feels good to know when we please God. There's this overwhelming satisfaction when we pass the tests that are laid out in front of us and when we're able to discern the tricks of the enemy. Amen. Well, there's another way for people to know just how good you've been and how you've been holding fast to your new creature status. It's called fruit. Come on, come on. So did anybody bring some fruit today? Come on. All right. Anybody? If you brought some fruit, raise your hand. Just some iffy people. Girl, you bring some fruit? <laughs> what, no, Tracy, now did you bring fruit? Yeah. That's all right. We're going to see if we can get you the fruit by the time we leave. Amen? Amen. Amen? The scripture at hand today comes from Galatians 5, starting at verse 19. If you could please stand for the reading of the scripture. Wait a little bit. If you have a say, amen. Amen. Okay, we're not. It says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lack of viciousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which that I tell you before, as I've I told you in the past, they that which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. Now that you have a better understanding of the word fruit, when I asked, turn to a neighbor and look at him and say, ah, fruit juice. Fruit juice. Yeah, say, turn one over. Say it again. Ah, fruit juice. Fruit juice. Now I'm going to be saying this throughout the whole thing. So, every time you hear me say, ah, your response is, fruit juice. That is. 
Okay, let's get into it. Y'all can be seated. Fruit juice. Come on. Now, the text says the fruit of the Spirit. This is going to be a small English lesson for you guys. Now, is that word singular or is it plural? Fruit. Both. The spirit. So does the uh, spirit produce one fruit or more than one? Let's find out. The word fruit can be used as a countable or uncountable noun. A countable noun is something that you can count with numbers. For example, one box, two boxes. An uncountable noun is something that you cannot count with numbers. For example, there are two cups of tea. Tea stayed in its singular form even though there is more than one cup. Meaning that the pluralization of the word fruit is fruit. When talking about the same kind of fruit. It only becomes acceptable to use fruits when talking about different kinds of fruit. Just like a tree doesn't have multiple fruits, growing on it has the same. The Bible says that we are to try the Spirit and see if it be of God, right? Why? Because if I am producing God's fruit, then I should be able to look at your life and recognize that you have the same fruit if we serve the same God. It's just like that old saying when people say, real, recognize real. If I'm a real Christian and serve the real God, then I should be able to look at you and identify your real fruit. If God's fruit, for example, is an apple, then being an orange isn't going to cut it. If I'm walking down the street as an apple, and I see another apple, we ought to be linked right off the bat that I can tell that what you have resonates with what I have. But there are some oranges out there. Now the orange is still a fruit, but it's not God's fruit. Working for the enemy or the flesh produces fruits as well. We've all heard the term the fruit of our labor. Anything that you are working in, whether it be good or evil, is going to have fruit or something that is a result from your hard work. Uh If you don't believe me, just watch. The first example comes from John 15, starting in verse 1 through 8. I am the true vine. And my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges, that it may bring forth more fruit. Right off the jump, we see fruit in its singular form. Every branch in me, meaning us. We are the branches in Jesus. So those of us that are not bearing fruit, he takes away. And those of us that do, he purges. See, like hair, we grow hair. But eventually we get split ends and it has to be cut in order to continue our growth. That's what he means by purging us. Verse 3. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. Come on now. We as humans cannot bear God's fruit without him. We have to be in him in order to show commitment to him. Many people think that we can earn God's fruit on our own, separate from Christ. These are the people who play church. 
They put on fake personalities and act like they got God in order to show off in front of other people. They try to earn God's fruit themselves because they think that God's fruit is material things. Verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth fruit, much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So if you didn't believe me, it says it for you right there. If a man abide in me, he is cast forth. I'm sorry, abide not in me. He is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Doesn't sound too inviting. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and that shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. You cannot be a follower of God if we do not bear fruit. The fruit is what shows people what we're living, how we're living, and how God, good God has been to you. Yes, sir. The other example, this one plays, it's always played, you know, with the time. This one is strictly for us, I promise you. Matthew 7, starting at verse 15 through 20. This reigns true in 2016. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. There is so much nonsense going on in today's church that church has become entertainment. Preachers and pastors have become people pleasers. They are not in it for God's word. And you can argue that they never were to begin with. So now we are in a generation where people are being raised up to cater to people and letting God's word fall by the wayside. Church has become about material things. What kind of car is the pastor driving? What kind of shoes do the first lady have on? <laughs> Pay less. We're going to pray for that one. <laughs> it has become what can the church do for me? And when I say church, I don't mean God. I mean, what can the pastor say to me that's going to make me feel better in a situation that I'm in that I don't plan on changing? That's how it has become. In three days, you'll receive so much money, you'll be blessed so big that you will never have to worry about life again. Have I heard that I come back every day too? But is there truth in it? No. Because they are false prophets. They are like ravening wolves that want to feed on the life struggles that you bring them and give you nothing in return but false hope. But we know we have true hope in Christ Jesus. 16. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles. Here it is. It says you shall know them by their fruits. We as children of God should know if somebody is on the enemy's payroll. There's only two sides. Good and evil. There is no in between. It is our duty to be able to discern other people's spirits. We should be able to pick apart somebody who is not truly in it based off the fruits that come out of their mouth. Amen. Fruits is in its plural sense. It tells us that working for the enemy again can also produce fruit. Notice how the farther people get away from God, the worse they become. They start lying more. 
they start fighting more. They don't care about people anymore. All right. And they want to discredit everything you say about God. Come on. That's because they're filling up their fruit basket with the enemy's fruit. All right. Come on. 17. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. If you really have God, you will not produce evil fruit. People say, oh, we know we still sin. Of course you do. But as a child of God, we should never be sitting long enough for it to turn in to tangible evil fruit. That's where your limit comes into play. Every tree that bringeth forth, not forth, good fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. Come on. Do you know why they use trees and fire in the Bible when speaking of hell? Come on. It's because wood burns so easily. Obviously, what do you think trees are made of? We, nobody else, we will be like wood burning easily in the lake of fire. Our souls will be extremely flammable and we will be able to fuel hell's flames for all eternity. We will. This right here. So keep thinking you can just say, I believe in God and not work to show for it. Good luck. Wherefore, by their fruits, you shall know them. Uh -huh. So I'm not saying judge the people. Only God can truly do that. <laughs> Judging them is putting them prematurely in heaven or hell. Nobody knows where anyone is going other than yourself. And we're questionable on that. But what you can do is assume. You are allowed to assume by the fruit that they bear that you either are or are not holding up their end of the bargain based off how you see their living. All right. You are allowed to assume. Ah. Fruit juice. Ah. Fruit juice. There it is. Let's look at God's fruit. How do you obtain this fruit? First off, it says the fruit of the Spirit. So it lets us know right off the bat that you at least have to have the spirit in order to gain this fruit. Secondly, you have to operate in the spirit. God doesn't care to use anyone who is not going to maintain their fruit. Gardeners are constantly looking out for their product day in and day out. If they miss a day or any type of maintenance, their fruit can wither away and die. They have to always stay on top of it. We have to constantly water and nourish our fruit with the proper ingredients. Those ingredients being found in the ultimate cookbook known as the Word of God. And as previously said, this word has nine traits that we as Christians should have. All right. Now, I'm not going to go through all nine. Because if I did, we'd be here longer than pastor preached. <laughs> but I am going to give you the big three. The big three that encompasses all of them. And you'll understand why in a minute. This is the first on the list. Joy. This is something that no one on earth can give you or take away from you. That's right. This comes from being righteous when you know that you have pleased God and stuck to his word and he blesses you for it. Man can't provide that. Man can provide happiness. But happiness can't compete with joy. You can be happy one minute and sad the next. Come on, come on. 
anyone with a negative energy, a bad day, or a bad story can steal your happiness. But for some reason, people stop at happiness. All right, all right. If they only knew, if they only knew that you could have everything taken from you and still walk around like you got everything. Because we have everything in Christ Jesus. We have joy. Next on this list, peace. Peace. Now I'm glad I get to use this now. <laughs> Been waiting a long time for it. For those of us who have kids, yeah, I said us. <laughs> Isn't it one of the greatest feelings when you've been working all day, been running errands all day, and you've been flat out, worn out, and by the grace of God, your child wants to take a nap. <laughs> if you don't get that, you need to leave right now. <laughs> Why? Because you know, for as long as they sleep, you will have what? Peace. That is. Even if you don't take a nap, you will have peace. Things go smoothly. You aren't rushing. You get your work done. You're not giving out death threats. I brought you in this world, I'll take you out. I hated that. To me, that was selfish, so you're going to kill me because you mad. <laughs> it's the same way with God. No matter what happens, no matter who wrongs you, no matter what problems arise, no matter what tests and trials the devil throw at you, you can be at peace knowing right. God got you. Amen. And that's a great feeling when you have true peace of mind and not pieces of mind that the world gives you and the last on this list of three and you'll see why I put this one last is love I decided to stop here because if I started I didn't have to continue there's no need to continue because in 1 Corinthians 13, 13 the greatest of these is love do you know why the love is so strong because God loves us. Our love is modeled after his. Look at what God's love does for us. Look at everything you've come from. Everything you've been protected from. And everything you've been blessed with. And everything you've been promised with. When you meet him face to face. God loves us. And because God loves us, he endows us with his spirit. And when we operate in the spirit, we will have joy, yes, sir. peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. If you operate in love, you get all of it. The greatest of these is love. Yes, sir. In the big scheme of things. God produces one specific kind of fruit. And there are different characteristics within this one fruit. Uh -huh. Not different kinds of fruit. We oftentimes get confused between fruit and gifts and talents. The Holy Spirit produces one fruit, but God can give an abundance of gifts and talents. And they're not correlated together. As humans, we think that just because we work harder than somebody else, that we ought to get blessed with more gifts. There'll be some really corrupt people around here if that's how it works. That's because we look at material things as means of gauging our success. Yes, sir. Gifts and talents are divinely given 
from how much God sees fit and fruit is dependent of the quality of work that you put in. Uh -huh. Some people, when they say, what about favor? Does favor count in terms of how you get, gain fruit? No. David had favor. But he also went through hardships. All right. David still worked his butt off in the position he was in, in Christ. Uh -huh. Honestly, ask yourself, would you want to be in David's shoes? Enough said. Hmm. Paul had favor. And as you know, it was Paul who ushered in an entire new era of Christianity for right. an entire generation. That's what you call hard work. Hmm. And you get tired because you came to Sunday school. Come on. Come on. <laughs> so, yes, they both had favor on their lives, but they were also two of the most hardworking men in the Bible. So we may have favor on our life, but that is no excuse not to operate in the Holy Ghost. How hard are you working? Are you putting in overtime? Or are you just showing up to work, punching your eight to five and still leaving at 4.30? not really accomplishing anything. You're just a body. But you're not putting forth any work. All right. Are you working? God doesn't give freebies in terms of fruit. You have to earn them. Favor has to do with a situation of life and grace has to do with your soul. Just because God has favor on one person and their life might not be as hard. Doesn't mean that that person didn't work as hard in their life or in their situation as anybody else. It is no excuse not to operate in the Holy Spirit. Let's get back to the initial scripture. And the nine different characteristics. Fruit of the Spirit. Nine different pieces of fruit. Each of these characteristics takes years to get, which is why it takes so long to get to a certain place in Christ. That's why you hear people say, I'm not there yet. That's because they haven't yet gained the part of the fruit, but after years of operation in the spirit, that fruit starts to come into fruition. That little piece to make one whole piece. Even after we gain one whole piece of fruit, we don't stop there. Your journey isn't complete. A lot of people aren't mentally prepared for the work that comes with obtaining this fruit. Which is why you hear people say, I didn't go through any of this before I got saved. It was easier before I came to Christ. That's because Satan's fruit can be likened to fast food. Anybody can pull up to a drive-thru, go to that number 10 with the extra large fry and the extra large drink. I don't hear <laughs> And don't get it twisted. It tastes real good. Real good. And at first, you might not notice a difference. But it ain't the most healthy thing for you to eat. Eventually, it will wear your body down. Makes you gain weight. I know y'all hear me. And it weighs you down with problems. You're not as agile as you used to be. All right. That's the same thing Satan's fruit does to our soul. It wears it down, and we risk dying from heart disease. Mm. Now, heart disease. Heart disease is Satan 
destroying or trying to destroy our heart so it cancels the ability to grow fruit. All right. You risk dying without God in your heart. Heart disease. But God's fruit is homegrown, made of the richest materials. It takes time, it takes talent, it takes passion in order to manifest God's fruit. We are in a generation where everybody wants to go to McDonald's and nobody wants to plant a garden. Most people don't even know how to because they've been spoiled by Satan's fruit. You see, Satan and the world know this. And they use this to their advantage. You ever wonder why soda can be 99 cents and a bottle of water is 205? <laughs> or Big Mac is 195 and the salad is 364? Don't that kind of sound backwards? That's because the world knows that you need these healthy items and will do one of two things to get it. You will either sacrifice money, which you also need to survive, All right. or you'll give up and keep getting the fast food. One of the two things. Either one you choose is going to be hard. There is no way around it. Nowhere when you entered in this world did you sign up for an easy life pass. But when you came to Christ, you signed up for an eternal life pass. The devil wants you to believe that you can survive off his fruits alone, so he lowers the price to almost free 99. Almost free 99. Every time you say it, I want to call him. What he doesn't tell you is that everything you charge on your card by the enemy's fruit, you have to pay back in the end. I don't think he takes checks. There's no item exchanges. He's, he's the one of those commercials you hear at the end and they got the main message out of the way. They persuaded you it sounds all good and that real fast talking dude comes on. Some things include, and they just keep going. <laughs> but our mindset is, well, if it was that important, they wouldn't have sped it up. <laughs> but it's actually the most important part that you need to be listening to. The main ingredient sounds real good. All right. It tastes good. It'll make you grow three feet. Cool. It don't tell you you'll have seizures. Your legs might fall out, your hair will fall out. They sped past that. But you were so enticed with that main message, you forgot about the most important part. Come on. However, over at God's grocery store, his fruit looks, he word looks, like it cost an arm and a leg. Mm. That's because we're looking at all the stuff that we think we have to give up. All right. oh, I gotta give up this. I gotta give up this, and that. But what you're not seeing is that God's fruit is like a mail in rebate. Yeah, you might have to give this up. You might have to give that up. But when we go out and check our mailbox, after we have purchased our fruit, we realize that what has came in the mail is greater than what we thought we had to initially give up right. in the right. first place. Then it sets in. We weren't really giving anything up. All right. We were just getting rid of excess. Excess problems. Excess stress. Excess bad habits. Excess people. And excess of anything that was never meant good for your life. All right. Fruit juice. One more time. Ah. Fruit, Fruit juice. juice. Fruit juice. You know, I'm glad I'm not long winded because I'm already sweating and I ain't done that. But you've been hearing me say fruit juice several times so far. 
And you're probably wondering where I get it from since I ain't said anything about juice so far. <coughs> so I had to lay a foundation of the importance of having fruit, first of all. You see, the enemy doesn't want you to gather God's fruit because he knows what we're capable of once we're in possession of God's fruit. He knows that the power in which we operate him is a threat to him and everything that he stands for. He attacks you constantly. Every attack, every plan, everything he throws at you is purposely trying to minimize your chances of gaining this fruit. And we know that he attacks you with things that the flesh love and things that the flesh hates. Heartache, pain, suffering. What happens when you put a piece of fruit under pressure? It begins to leak. The more pressure it comes under, the more it leaks. I'm getting ready to shut it down. Satan attacks us with the pressures of sin constantly trying to destroy our fruit. He wants to rip it. He wants to stomp it. He wants to peel it. He wants to squish it. What he thinks is destroying our fruit is actually helping us. You don't get to the liquid without first prepping the fruit. Every time he hits us, boom. We release a drop. Come on. Boom, one attack. Boom, another attack. Boom, another one. Right. And another one. Years go by. Attack after attack. And we have been attacked so much yes, that now we have the ability to fill up this cup right. of this liquid. Uh -huh. So Satan laughs. He sees us down and he thinks we're defeated by his attacks mm. in this life. He thinks that he has destroyed our fruit. Our fruit, which we worked so hard to gain and are left with this useless liquid. <laughs> How wrong he is. The reason this liquid is so valuable is because it is your testimony. People ask, how did you make it out of that? How did you overcome this? When people are watching our lives and want to know how we won the victory and know how we overcome, we grab our cup and say, here, drink this. They take the cup, they grab it, they lift it up, they take a sip, and they say, ah, juice. This is how we show people how good we've been. This is how we show people how we have overcome the trials and the tricks of the enemy. Come on. By the fruit that Satan seeks out to destroy but does not win. All, All he right. does is help Come us on. produce testimony yes, for everybody to drink and say, here. This is how I made it out. All right. This is what you can have if you come to Christ Jesus. Yeah. Fruit juice. Yes, sir. And in my last sentence, you can go ahead and start. <laughs> There's a hidden meaning to Luke 6 and 38. And there it is right there. I'm going to input this so you can follow me. It says, give, and it shall be given unto you good measure. Our fruit will be pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men pour into your bosoms 